Hi, everyone. I'm Jillian Sidoti. And I'm Nate Dodson. And automation is a good thing. And this is why. So, Nate, tell me why automation is a good thing. Oh, my God, because it makes life so much easier. (laughs) No, but really, I mean, it's good for, I would say, kind of everybody, although it is a complete pain going through those self-checkout lines nowadays at the grocery store. Not really talking about that. However, as an example, we like and really leverage automation and technology as much as we can within our own business. It just simply reduces kind of the wasted time, the administrative time. Time that takes somebody to do a lot of these things. Mm-hmm. But when we utilize and leverage technology, taking something that can take hours to now taking five minutes, it's actually at least for, for, or for crowdfunding lawyers for our business, uh, has allowed us to really focus more on the clients and communications and actually creating more interaction with people rather than less, which I think is a big fear with the automations. I do think that is one fear, but what about the argument that when you implement automation, you're taking away jobs? Yes, but no. You're shifting jobs. The market shifts. The world shifts. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, I definitely I agree with you that there is a risk to the uneducated, to the more kind of the, the assembly line. Mm-hmm. It doesn't help with those situations, but let's be honest, if we look at our current economy, anything that involves more the monotonous person focus is really getting done in China Mm -hmm. or India. So we're already seeing that shift of where the assembly line jobs are either going to robots or going offshore. So I don't know how much it really affects. You got a good point there. So we actually could help Americans in general by bringing automation back. We're not taking away jobs. I'll give you a specific example. I invested in a company called Miso Robotics. And what Miso Robotics does is they can retrofit robots to any fast food kitchen. They're already Mm -hmm. in White Castle and they're going to be going into Jack in the Box where robots will make your fast food for you. And the argument I always hear about it is that's taking away jobs. But the reality is those aren't jobs people really want to be. You're going to have incredible efficiencies in terms of time, how quickly food can get out, less human error, less germs, smaller environmental footprint, lower operating costs, of course, for the business. But profitability aside, what I hear you saying is that we could actually start bringing things that we are putting offshore to other countries back on shore through automation. Exactly. And really our economy is such a service-based economy. It just kind of, how do we define service? If it is client service, customer service, let's focus on giving people what they want while the assembly line is automated in the background. It can create actually a better experience if the companies choose to reallocate their investment to make the client experience even better. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing and that's where life gets better for all of us as if it can be more efficient. But if these jobs get taken away, right, and automation is taking place, then how do we take care of people? So I actually think we are getting to the point that more and more having that social safety net is really important. Traditionally, we haven't had it other than social security, which that's another fun tax unto itself. But we're we're talking about really taking away positions that will never come back. Mm -hmm. And there is that potential risk that the jobs just aren't there anymore for anybody that's been used to working in the kitchen, Mm -hmm. been used to, you know, I remember one job that I had when I was barely licensed to drive was driving checks from the small Texas towns to the big city for processing at a bank. And it was like, a full-time job just driving checks around. Nowadays, of course, that position is gone as it should be. They just scan it in and do their remote processing. Should that job have been saved? Does it make our country or our economy any better? I would say not at all. So that- That's a perfect argument for why automation needs to eliminate jobs. Like, Look at the environmental impact you probably had driving around all day and how inefficient that is. You could be 
doing something so much more important than driving from point A to a bank every single day. So that's a great job to be eliminated, no offense. But what do you say to the 50-year-old truck driver who is trained as a truck driver, has been Mm -hmm. driving trucks and drives across the country from California to Florida every week? And Mm -hmm. now you're telling them, sorry, your job doesn't exist because Tesla created self-driving trucks. What do you say to something like that? I would tell him, don't worry about it. Your (laughs) job is safe. Now the 21-year-old that is thinking about what to do with their life, they should think long and hard before they decide to be a long-haul trucker. Let's be honest, even if it becomes a reality that these Tesla trucks, which I'm a massive Tesla fan, that would be phenomenal. And right now we're dealing with some of the worst supply chain issues that have ever affected us. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is coming down to there's not enough truckers. Mm -hmm. They're in a pretty good position at this point. And even if those automated trucks start running, it's going to be decades before it really has a, a material material impact, at least in my opinion. In that case, that's true. And I mean, the other argument is, is that, you know, when we talk about robotic surgery and things like that, we don't worry about displacing doctors who went through years and years of medical school and then being displaced. We're always talking about, you know, the fast food worker or the Uber driver who gets, you know, replaced by an autonomous vehicle. But we don't say that about the pilot who really doesn't fly a plane much anymore. They just sit there and watch the controls because most planes now fly themselves. So it's still need somebody there to watch plane, right? So like, let's just say we have all this free time and and we don't have to work as much and things are more efficient. Then what? What do we do then? Well, I really miss golfing. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> actually enjoy a little bit of that quality of life mm-hmm. that should have and was expected to go along with the American dream. Right. Here, here, right? Like I feel bad mostly for millennials who seem to have no time. I mean, I see more TikToks teaching millennials how to have a high like side hustle or Gen Z, how to have a side side hustle because their primary employment doesn't pay the bills, doesn't pay the cost of living overall. And that's what worries me is that people who are not skilled or don't know how to pivot career-wise or just don't have the time or the energy or the space or they have health issues, whatever it might be, they can't pivot and they can't figure it out. I worry about those people. And for me, I think as a nation, before we get to these issues of truck drivers being displaced, forget the fast food workers, they can go work retail or something. I mean, that that's a minimum wage job. You can move to another minimum wage job, but the middle skills, right? Those, and then the upper skills too, lawyers, engineers, architects that can all be done by robots. How do we take care of the members of society? And I don't know if you've considered this, but I certainly have. And I think we should be looking at universal basic income. I agree. And I think that more and more, it more than just makes sense. The capitalism system, it worked its magic, but it's created this vision of the wealthy, the have and the have nots. And the have nots are getting farther and farther left behind. And you know what? They need help. I don't have any issue with why shouldn't we at least provide that base level of protection for our fellow citizen, part of our community? Yeah, no, absolutely. And then for those of you that don't know, you know, universal basic income is it's a policy which basically says every single person gets the same amount of money provided by the government, like a cash payment. So let's just say, for, by example, it's a thousand dollars a month. If you gave a wealthy person a thousand dollars a month, they're gonna they're gonna give it to charity. They're gonna put it into savings. It's not going to make a difference. But that thousand dollars a month could make all the difference in the world to somebody who's hungry, somebody who can't make their car payment that month, all of those things. So to me, that makes a lot of sense. Now, I got challenged on this recently, being saying that was a communist policy. And I I wholly disagree that it's absolutely not a communist policy. Communist policy is when you, you hold people down so they all remain equal. In this case, we're lifting everyone out so they have a chance at becoming equal. There's nothing about $1,000 a month that makes us all equal. (laughs) Nothing at all. Exactly. I wonder how you feel about that argument of like, that's a communistic policy. I mean, that for people that don't know what communism means, yeah, it makes sense. But really with the government defining the jobs, defining the work that you have to do, defining what you get paid for that work and keeping everybody equal, that's not what's being talked about at all. I would just call it nothing more then uh, it's a form of welfare because of the people that need it to help their survival. 
I see it no different than Social Security. It's getting paid to the old. Why not just expand Social Security to cover everybody subject to some income cap? Frankly, when it even comes to Social Security, when we're talking about the millennials or even in our generation, are we going to have Social Security when we get there? Or is it really going to even make a difference no, because the problem, of the liberal? Yeah, the problem is, is we paid into it and we're never going to see it. It's unfortunate. But beyond that scope, it's just in this country, we waste the money on a lot of things and a lot of it isn't on our citizens. The thing that bothers me, I think, the most is that welfare has become this dirty word. You know, I include myself in that statement where we talk about wealth welfare, awful, terrible, like tax on society overall, because we're we're paying to take care of other people. But don't we want people to the welfare of others to be okay? (laughs) Like I'm not, we're not talking like, you know, incredibly prosperous. We're talking about it's good for all of us if our lowest common denominator citizen is doing okay, that their welfare is taken care of. And it hurts me that we've a country that has such incredible prosperity that way, that that is that the welfare of women, children, people who can't take care of themselves is not worthy of tax dollars. I don't know what the statistic is, but if you look at new mothers that get on WIC or welfare, or whatever the, the program is, it's more than half. And I remember when for both of our children, it was like uh, somebody came in to tell us all about the WIC services, like as soon as our kids were born. Yeah. And we're really confused when we're like, no, we're fine. Like we don't need it, mm-hmm. but you can get all of this stuff, and we're like, but we don't need it. We don't qualify for it, we're fine. But it really left an impression with me that it was just so expected. And you know what? It's so expensive to raise kids that I get it entirely. But why should that be a special situation? Why should Social Security be a special situation where if people are struggling, we should be helping them? You know, it's funny you said that because I remember when the first one was born, the WIC office called me relentlessly to see if I wanted WIC. And I said, when I finally answered the phone, the woman it's like, do you want, do you want to go on WIC? And I said, no, I don't qualify. And she's like, well, you'd be surprised. It doesn't take much to qualify. And I said, okay, what do I get? I just want to see. <laughs> <laughs> what I could get. Isn't her desk. Yeah. And she starts telling me and I was like, I was like, listen, I go, I know you think I might qualify. I'm not going to, I, I'm telling you I'm not. And she goes, well, how much do you make? I go, I'm a lawyer. And she said, she, there was a moment of silence. And then she said, you know what? You'd have to be a really bad lawyer. <laughs> 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 and I said, yeah. So, and at the time I thought, wow, what a waste of taxpayer money to come after me, you know, to try to force WIC on me. And, and in hindsight, I see it totally different now because I think about it as what a great use of time to make sure that our most vulnerable citizens babies are being taken care of because we don't know, you know, we don't know which mothers are are ashamed or, you know, don't have a support system or, you know, don't know where to turn or don't know what to do. So I, actually, I, I have a completely different view of it now that it's not such a waste of money. But okay, we've totally changed the topic from... Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to I want to kind of steer us back. What, what do you think are the most important things we have to focus on when it comes to to automation and what we need to be uh, looking out for in automation. I would say that the biggest things are for yourselves personally, how are you focusing your own personal growth into areas that cannot be easily automated so that you don't end up in a position that will no longer exist. Yeah. Second thing would be if you are already in one of those positions, embrace it as much as humanly possible because it should allow you to actually reach out and talk to your customers more and actually increase that level of service that you can provide. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I would suggest is watch out for Terminator. They're on their way. AI is taking it over. So (laughs) watch out. (laughs) Okay. So look, if you're running a business and you are looking at automation and seeing, you know, how can we put automation? I don't want you to fear automation because I think automation for you, if you can get to your client, like Nate said, how they do it at crowdfunding lawyers, which is, when I was at crowdfunding lawyers, that was a huge thing for me to see how many things could we operate 
automate to make it a better experience for both us as attorneys so we could get things done more efficiently, better, faster, um, it, it, with better customer service, and then also better for the client because they got a superior product in less time, right? So here are some things you can do for your own business. How can you lower operating costs using automation? Um, what can you do to get faster ROI, return on investment? What, Where can you put things into place in terms of automation? And if you think about it, QuickBooks is a form of automation. You know, emailed billing is a form of automation that didn't previously exist. You used to have to like print out bills and send them in the mail and you don't have to do that anymore. Um, you know, a form of automation is accepting credit cards, guys. So you can't just think it's about robots, you know, taking over the world and being terminators and fast food cooks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and it, it's going to give you the ability. Um, how can you use automation and, and giving you the ability to be more competitive? What can you offer in, in and how can you automate what you offer um, to be more competitive? And and those are those are the things I would I would the three things I would recommend in um, running your business with automation. Nate, any final words? Uh, yes. Never forget, if you're not automating your business, your competition is. Very good. All right. Bye, everyone. I'm Jillian Sadoti. And I'm Nate Dodson. And this is why.